Criminal courts give up on petty cases, and Canada falls in the world's competitive economy rankings. I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. Canada's legal system is literally in shambles, and our first article today confirms that. According to the CBC, people accused of petty crimes like shoplifting, minor assault, and even fraud are walking free in Canada. The reason why? Simply put, the justice system is too busy. They don't have the time to deal with these cases because they're already struggling to make moves on more serious crimes like rape and murder. One involved party says, at some point, we have to make a decision about which crimes do you want us to prosecute. Um, well, maybe we want all of them to be prosecuted. They are criminal offenses after all, and they are not allowed. If the crimes are so petty and unworthy of punishment, then get them off the books. That's a whole different argument though. You can't do that because the crimes they're talking about aren't that petty. Theft, minor assault, fraud, that's not child's play. We aren't talking about something like jaywalking. These all have massive implications and it outreaches far more than just the individual. They can have tremendous downsides to society at large and that's why they're illegal in the first place. I have a major issue with this asinine line of thinking. The government has a responsibility to its citizens to uphold the rule of law. Once that standard crumbles, we enter a form of anarchy. Ask yourself this, what is your vision for an ideal society? I guarantee, actually here, take a second, really think about it. Okay, now, I guarantee that whatever you came up with, there is no things such as theft, fraud, minor assault, those kind of things are happening normally and people are not getting away with it. As a matter of fact, in an ideal society, they're not probably going to be there in the first place. These are ideals that we have to strive towards, not go backwards on them. Now, you have the crown that's letting people walk free because they don't have the capacity to prosecute people for committing these offenses. Ask yourself another thing. What kind of consequences does that have for society at large? Well, most certainly, first of all, it's not moving us towards a more productive living space. It's doing the opposite. They've also idiotically admitted that certain types of crimes come with a get-out-of-jail-free pass. We don't have time to deal with you. I guess stealing is okay now because no consequences are going to come of it. This, in effect, acts as a pseudo-decriminalization of sorts for a lot of things. A lot of things are classified under petty crimes, and if we don't have the capacity to prosecute it, What's that going to mean to people who are thinking about doing them? Criminals? People who are contemplating becoming criminals? It's basically an encouragement. Terrible practice, and I'm so baffled as to why they would make that statement in the first place. The very fact that we do not have the capacity to serve justice in all these regards is itself a major problem. Why do we have to pick between a murder case and fraud? They both deserve to be reprimanded, Obviously, they're not on the same level of evil, but they're both still illegal and they're not allowed. Some people have suggested that, well, if the courts have such a massive backlog, why don't they just push back these cases and deal with them eventually? Unfortunately, that's not possible in the Canadian justice system because they work with a certain level of contingency on something that's called reasonable process time. Courts have a certain time limit that plays a part in dismissal cases. In provincial courts, if your case is not heard in the first 18 months, it's deemed unreasonable and you're off the hook. No matter what it is, 18 months and then you're gone. In the superior court, the limit is 30 months and once you get past that, they'll no longer hear your case. These limits place an incentive upon the system to rank order cases because they fear something like a murderer getting off on a contingency that sweeps under the rug a lot of other cases that don't have precedence. There really is no winning situation here. It's evil and more evil. You have to pick between the two bad choices and find the one that's the least harmful to society. It's either you have people waiting five years, maybe even longer to get a hearing for something they committed, a crime they committed in the past, or you set these sort of arbitrary time limits and once they pass, people are freed and let go, no charges because if you think about it, Having someone wait to get a hearing, that itself is quite torturous, and at the same time, the facts of the case can be forgotten. A lot of stuff is going to happen between now and then, 
In an ideal reality, once you commit a crime, you will be held accountable and you'll have your court hearing almost immediately. But because of all the criminals and all the stuff we have to process, it's not possible. So how should we have it? Canada's already made its call and this is the system we have to abide within right now. It's very interesting because even I'm unsure of what constitutes petty in the eyes of the court. It's a fairly subjective measure. If you're the victim of theft, I'd assume you wouldn't consider that petty and you would want justice. You would want to be repaid for whatever was stolen from you and you would want the person to be held accountable. There's also varying degrees of damage. You can measure that financially, emotionally, or even physically. Someone stealing a pack of gum from the dollar store is one thing. Someone shoplifting as a repeated habit and forcing a store to go out of business, well, that's something else entirely. There are gradations to each of these crimes, and within the crime itself, such as shoplifting, some instances can be considered petty, while others would not be. So, it's very interesting how they're going to be forced to make these calls when they're deciding which ones to hear and which ones to toss out. As I said, they should all be heard, and that's the best solution here, so I don't understand why we're not working towards that. Instead, the easy way out is just to toss them out, but as you can see, it creates issues when we have to rely on the subjectivity of these legal officials. And also, at the end of the day, laws keep a lot of bad desires at bay because of the possibility of consequences. Those consequences make the actions not worth it, at least seemingly not worth it, because the odds of getting caught are always at the back of your mind. Even if you can get away with something and there's a small chance you get caught, that small fear is going to deter a lot of people. Once you remove the accountability, it's a can of worms, and that's essentially what happened today. The accountability aspect, the thought of you getting caught, has been taken off. They're telling people, we have such a backlog that petty crimes, yeah, we can't look at them. Where's the accountability now? Here's something to consider. Last year, the Retail Council estimated that shoplifting accounted for up to $5 billion in losses for Canadian stores. I would assume that with this lack of regard for shoplifting, that figure has a lot of room to inflate. It's also not just the companies who are going to suffer here. If the company takes enough of a loss that makes operating in a certain area unprofitable, the community will also suffer. The store will close down, you will lose jobs, and you will lose access to goods. It's a recipe for disaster no matter how you slice it, and that's why they need to be protected. That's what the court of law is here for. Some of these stores have began to take these claims to civil court to recoup some of the losses, but that does not hold the same water as being prosecuted in a criminal justice system. There's also another alternative here, which is even darker. It's called vigilante justice. If the law is not going to protect you, certain stores might take measures into their own hands. They might start hiring armed security guards, even the manager himself if he's the store owner, he might get involved in physically confronting shoplifters. It's not something you want to see in a developed society because it puts a risk of escalating things beyond their natural tendency. You could have more fights. You could have someone accidentally dying. You could have an employee getting involved and becoming a victim of collateral damage. It's not like we're going to have a vigilante like Batman out here who's going to uphold all of our laws professionally and not kill anybody. Once we start giving storefronts and individuals an incentive to enact vigilante justice is not going to end well because the people are just that. They are people and they're making judgment calls often under emotional stress. If you own a store and you're seeing it getting robbed, you're not going to stand by, especially if you know that the police might arrest him, but the person's going to walk free with your stuff. He's not going to be held accountable. You might take it upon yourself to extract some form of justice because that's what a lot of people want when they have criminals prosecuted, they want justice and now it's being taken away from them. It could spell a very ugly, ugly situation for a lot of communities out here. Given all of these facts, it's painfully obvious that more resources need to be deployed. The supply of judges and justices is not keeping up with the demand. This should be a major initiative because it's pressing up against society right now. I also wonder if there's any red tape we can rip off here. What I mean by that is maybe like paperwork and administrative processes that bog down the entire legal process. I've never experienced a criminal court firsthand, but since it's a government agency, I have a strong suspicion there are ways to streamline things. 
maybe making use of one of the pillars in our brand new digital charter that would incorporate some form of technology to speed up the process. I also can shake this weird feeling though. It's It's been a common thing to hear that supposedly crime has been going down, it's on the decline. So why then are we struggling so hard right now? The symptoms of the court system seem more synonymous with an increase in crime if anything. Something's not really adding up here. If you're telling me that crime is on the downward spiral, but all of a sudden you can't keep up anymore, well, what kind of crime are you talking about in the first place then? Because now you can't keep up with the petty crime. Is it because there's more concentration at the top? Or is it because these stats are wrong? Or is it because they're misleading? Or maybe funding got cut to, co to courts. Maybe you don't have the resources that you need. Let's make that clear and have that conversation so we can tackle the problem. There's such a layer of mystery right now surrounding the entire debacle and I'm not too sure why that is. I mean, it seems very likely that it's simply a money issue and more funds need to be given to the system so they can employ more people and get the right instruments available so they can handle these new challenges. And just from hearing that itself, it begs another question. Does Canada even have enough funds to sustain itself? We take part in a lot of goodwill, but key infrastructure within our own country is crumbling before our very eyes. Maybe it's time to reassess where the money's being spent and allocate it to somewhere that needs it critically. So enough about that. Now we're moving on to some more bad news, unfortunately. Canada has fallen out of the top 10 in terms of competitive economies in the world. We've slipped all the way down to number 13 out of 63 countries. And this is the worst ranking Canada's ever had since 1997. That was also the year when the index was first created. So it's been a long time of success, and now something's gone wrong. Canada is in a very weird spot because we've not developed a clear competitive advantage to differentiate us between the other countries. On one hand, you have very aggressive market focus systems like Singapore and the United States who are just dominating right now. And then on the other hand, you have countries like the Nordic countries who focus more on a work-life balance and they're getting a lot of value from their workforce. So in that first example, Singapore, a market economy who is doing very well financially. They're actually ranked number one. The United States, ranked number three. Then you have some of the Nordic countries who focus more on that balance and getting a happy, strong workforce. All of those countries, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, they're all ranked above Canada as well. Canada is kind of in the middle of those. We're trying to have a free market, be strong economically, but we've also adopted some interesting policies that are similar to those European countries there. We have the healthcare, we have some other social initiatives, which are all good, but we haven't differentiated ourselves. We're kind of in the middle right now. And that's important to note. It's not the sole reason for our ranking and the other rankings of the countries, but it definitely plays a part here. It's the way they're organized and that affects their production outputs. If you had to really think about it and fit our country into a silo, it's not clean cut. As I've said, we have a combination of both these realms here. So really interesting product placement in terms of where our country is. In 2015, Canada began to fall off hard in terms of these rankings because the price of oil started to fall. That's one of our key export industries. The report points out that a single prime minister really is not to blame for our decline in competitiveness. It's been a long-term trend and it's existed for quite some time now. Before we get even deeper into analyzing the findings, one thing that's important to note here is that the index measures competitiveness in terms of, you could say, productivity. That itself is an output and you get that output via a number of factors like production, people, machineries, etc. The higher the output you can get while keeping your input measures, like the people and the machines the same, the better your productivity is. The more you can produce with the same assets, the better. If you increase your assets, your productivity better multiply with a numeral higher than just one. Getting that extra output will have a ripple effect and do well for your economy and your rating in terms of this index. So people were wondering, why, why did Canada fall off? We seem to be doing so well for quite some time. One factor that was identified was the lack of innovation that Canada is currently experiencing. This wonderful thing called technology, yeah, that stuff. It propels productivity and we're not creating enough here in Canada. To give you an idea, 
of why this matters so much, let's think back to the days of before machinery helped us plow fields and stuff like that. One person may be able to produce a pound of wheat in a day. I'm not too sure if those numbers are accurate, but it's just an example and you can really understand the sentiment through it. So with a tractor and a mill, that same person who is only producing one pound, now with this help of technology, his productivity has skyrocketed. He can produce maybe a thousand pounds per day. Once again, I'm not too sure if those numbers are correct, but it gives you an idea because that's what technology does. It scales your productivity up exponentially and makes you highly effective at what you're doing. We're currently not innovating enough to get that boost in technology that would then turn our production into a very efficient industry. Being the first country to come up with a new innovative way to do something, it gives you a bunch of first mover advantages. Sometimes you might not even share that tech with the worst of the world if you have strong trademarks on it and you don't want it to get out. So there's major benefits to being the first to figure something out. When Canadians typically build something, there's so much pressure from the United States to either sell it or get bought out. A lot of tech entrepreneurs actually build their business with the hopes of being bought out. They can get a quick payday, but after that, it doesn't benefit the Canadian community that much because the technology, the ideas, all that productivity, it's being siphoned away to the company who bought it. And oftentimes, it's an American-based industry. So there's one problem. If you think about it, maybe we had BlackBerry leading the way for Canadian tech for some time, but as a lot of you probably know, they fell off drastically. Now the second problem is the brain drain. A lot of Canadian students who are well-educated, we spend a lot of money training them and they become bright. They're being drawn away by the flashy lights of a lot of American companies like Apple, like Google, like Amazon. They're being drawn away to go move to Silicon Valley, for example. And as a result, the Canadian economy suffers. We lose a lot of capable individuals who could help propel our economy and instead they're working for another country. Now, you can make the argument that it's not the students' faults, actually. They want to get a good job for a good company. Canada has to do more to start building these companies up from a grassroots level. We need some national giants to really keep students here. Give them the incentive to want to work for a Canadian giant. Is this currently not there right now? And it's funny. When some of the best businesses you have in Canada to invest in, for example, are banks who pay out heavily in dividends. Well, that's a good thing, but if you think about it, the fact that they're paying out dividends means they're not really growing that much, and those are some of the best companies to invest in. We need more tech companies and stuff to keep development here. It's funny because Canada is actually ranked sixth in terms of attracting skilled and talented people from around the world, but domestic talent still remains an issue as well as labor shortages. Maybe we're bringing in good talent, but we're losing a lot at the same time. And there's also so many vacant jobs in Canada and there's not enough people with the right skill sets to fill them. We have an abundance of positions like that and as a result, we're forced to outsource them to the international market. And once you enter that field, there's a lot of competitors who are bidding for talented people. As I mentioned before, the United States is a major competitor and they swallow up a large market share. So how can we improve? First of all, I think we have to invest more in innovation. Encourage Canadian ownership. Get these companies built up from the ground up. Put more money into scale-up type of industries, incubators. Get more entrepreneurs on the field. Maybe you give them some rebates or incentives, some grants. Get the minds flowing. Get the ideas coming out and start building something. And next step, once it's built, make sure there's an incentive to not just sell it away. Because it really is a loss. If we've invested so many resources to get a good Canadian idea and someone else just comes out left field and buys it from us, well, that's not doing too much for the country. It has to remain Canadian. That's more challenging than just funding them because it really is up to the business owners. So we need to start instilling a sense of pride, a sense of urgency that something has to be done or Canada might continue to fall off on the economic charts. And finally, maybe we can learn a lot from these other countries who have a leading practice. The Americans very strong market economies with slightly less regulations and easier tax laws. A lot of companies want to go over there. Maybe that's something to learn from, maybe not. Then there's the other side of the equation if you fancy that better. The Nordic countries. They treat their employees so well that they produce more actually. They're a happier workforce 
and they actually want to go to work. It gives me motivation and a sense of pride to do good jobs, better work hours, more benefits, more work-life balance. Maybe that's an approach that we should adopt fully. Really, there's so many options here. The point is we need to do something and we have to do it soon. So that brings me to the end of the episode. Thanks for joining me. If you enjoyed the content, be sure to leave a review and follow us on Twitter at Perry Platform. I'll see you soon.